What's up people, how are you doing? If you guys remember, I released a video explaining the talents in Talentless Nana, and before the editing process it was so long that I just thought, no, this is not right. So with the aim of making my videos as short and concise as possible, I split it into two parts, and this, my good friends, is the promised part two. If you haven't seen the first video, you can always explore the channel and check it out there. I'll also be putting the link in the description so it's only one click away, and I advise you guys to seek enlightenment because what's a part two without a part one? All the characters I left out in the first video are going to be analyzed in this video, and I'm gonna be leaving the timestamps in the description for specific characters. Cute and cuddly, innocent and lacking a sense of danger, Michiru is a mascot character that walked into the wrong anime, but in spite of her personality, she does adapt rather easily to the gruesome events occurring on the island, and I guess you could put that down to the experience she's gained working in a hospital. Having a talent that's suitable for healing and a means to utilize it in a hospital setting, she does unfortunately become familiar with sickness and death, but like all the other talents in the series, her ability doesn't come without its fair share of setbacks. She's capable of healing external wounds by licking them, and this includes injury to the skin and muscles. She can also utilize this ability on her own injuries as long as she can reach them with her tongue. And a good takeaway would be that it's never really mentioned that her saliva itself contains healing properties, so with a lack of reference to what would be an unrealistically overlooked condition, one has to assume that her saliva or any other body fluids for that matter has nothing to do with her ability. I can only speculate but it's probably the very act of placing her tongue directly on a wound that activates her talent. After spending an entire day with Michiru, Nana surmises that her talent is also able to stop internal bleeding, and this is a deduction that I initially found to be in conflict with what Michiru herself states her power to be capable of, that being, it can only work on external wounds. As much as I hammered the author for a bunch of flaws and Plotos, even he wouldn't make such an obviously contradictory character setting for one of the most integral roles in the story. And the best rationale I could come up with was that the meaning was lost in translation. I may take pride in knowing the context every time Yari Yari is used in an anime, but my fluence in the Japanese language is definitely on the lower end of the spectrum. Actually, it's probably non-existent. And on that basis, a little hypothesizing was involved in trying to figure out what exactly Nana meant. So this is my take. If someone gets stabbed and the knife ends up piercing their liver, causing internal bleeding, then by licking the stab wound, Michiru would be healing the external wound and by extension, the injury to the liver. But if someone gets struck with a baseball bat in the torso and the impact ends up rupturing their spleen, then that's a kind of injury Michiru can do nothing about. So essentially my theory is that she can only heal internal injuries that come as a direct consequence of visible external injury. I may be completely wrong, so maybe someone with a better understanding of the Japanese language could give me a more plausible interpretation. But for now, that's what I'm gonna go with. Actually, you don't even have to understand Japanese, I'd just love to know what you think in the comments. While her talent is effective against the most severe external injuries, it remains utterly powerless in the face of illness and poison. It may be able to stabilize a person's medical condition, but replenishing lost blood is questionable at best. However, the biggest demerit of this talent is that it comes at the cost of one's own life. Each and every use of this ability drains Michiru's lifespan, and the most critical injuries have been shown to cause her to lose consciousness to the point of life-threatening levels. With the knowledge that talents are in a constant state of evolution, there was a lot of foreshadowing that Michiru's power would have been capable of resurrection sometime in the future, and in what's probably the closest thing to resurrection, she succeeds in healing Nana's fatal injuries, but she does so at the cost of her life. She almost seems to transfer her own life force to a dying Nana, and to be honest, her death didn't really come as a surprise. As a potential tool for character development, her fate was sealed from the moment Nana got emotionally invested in her. But even though her death was somewhat expected by us, the audience, the impact of Nana's loss was no less damaging. A beautiful end to a beautiful soul. I've been avoiding this next character because the thought of his talent is enough to give me a migraine. Powers related to time are subject to the deepest levels of scrutiny, and as a result, their application has to at the very least appear to be rationally airtight, and therein lies the cause of my frustration, because the author seems to have put very little thought into making Shibusawa's ability as faultless as possible. His talent is initially believed to be the ability to stop time, and after some basic deductive skills from Nana, he reveals that he's actually able to travel back in time. The farthest he could go back in time was a period of 24 hours in the past, and up to the point of his death, he hadn't been able to break that limit. As a compensatory mechanism, the farther back he went in time, the more exhausted he would get, and over 12 hours would leave him in a worn out, nauseated state. The consequences of him meeting his past self are unknown, and I would have loved to see how the author portrayed that kind of situation, but he does delve into the upshots of a slightly similar scenario. When anyone in the past meets his eyes and registers his appearance, he's unable to maintain presence and is promptly sent back to his own time. And this is where my migraine starts to kick in, because there's so much about this talent that simply doesn't make sense. When he uses his talent to go back in time, he appears in the same geographical spot as the point he travelled from, but what happens to the version of himself in the past he travels to? It would be easy to say that past Shibusawa goes about his business totally oblivious of the situation. You know, future Shibusawa would choose a spot where past versions of neither himself nor his classmates would be present. But it's not that easy, because Shibusawa actually uses his power to travel back in time to a spot where past Shibusawa was simultaneously occupying. And this happens twice, once in the classroom to stop Mogo from punching Shoichi, and the second time to stop Nana from spilling some water on him. So what? Does that mean that his future self fuses with his past self and things go back to normal once he's done using his ability? And if that's the case, wouldn't there be some serious implications if they were in different places and past Shibusawa 
vanished in the presence of others to fuse with his future version. You could make an argument that this fusion of sorts only happens in future Shibusa appears in the same spot as past Shibusa, and this is a stretch, but I'm genuinely trying to figure out how this talent works, so hear me out. Even if that were the case, doesn't he use his ability in a room full of witnesses? There's no way he does something as conspicuous as shoving Mogo to the floor before anyone registers his presence and he's ultimately sent back to his own time. But that's not all, he supposedly goes back in time to stop a couple of events from happening. Things like Mogo grabbing onto Shoichi's shirt, or Nana knocking over the glass of water. So why oh why do people still retain memories of events that should never have occurred? I don't even want to talk about time paradoxes or multiple timelines or the butterfly effect because this talent would trivialize such concepts. It would be akin to using a toddler's scribbles to explain the theory of relativity. I would have loved to know what kind of drugs the author was on when he was thinking up this ability. But on the flip side, I am willing to reluctantly accept the idea that perhaps I'm not as smart as I think I am. So someone please break it down for me. Moving on is a character who's supposed to be flashy and popular with the ladies, but ironically, the most interesting thing about him is his plain stone-faced girlfriend. Say his ability is cryokinesis, he's capable of manipulating ice and freezing objects at will. This is a power that's been recycled over and over in anime, so I don't want to waste too much time on it. He manages to freeze a 5 meter deep lake without even breaking a sweat. If there's any limitation to his power, it's that he can't freeze human beings and animals and even this is just conjecture. Even so, this wouldn't really cause any trouble in a fight cause he could essentially freeze the clothes and shoes on his opponent to restrict their movement. That is, unless he was fighting a degenerate exhibitionist. And I honestly would wouldn't put it past this author to create that kind of character. And just like Seiya, Mogo is a de facto leader of one of the factions in class. His talent is the ability to manipulate fire. Again, there's nothing new about this. If anything, he's only been shown to create fire and use the flames as projectors. Apart from that, he can also discharge fire from his hands at point blank range, but that's about it. Along with Seiya, Mogo is basically used to represent the gullibility of the class, which sucks because he seems to genuinely care about his followers. And speaking of Mogo's followers, Sota is the most barefaced throwaway character in this story. He could be replaced by literally anyone and no one would even bat an eye. His ability is to mimic voices perfectly and he doesn't really have much application in combat or in anything really. His talent's drawback is as ridiculous as the talent itself. The only way he can stop his ability is by repeating the last thing he said, meaning this ability is probably limited to human voices. Minion number 2 isn't any better. Shoichi probably has the edge of a Sota but that's only because of how utterly impractical Sota's talent is. Shoichi can turn his body into a magnet, that may sound like a cool ability and with some development it possibly could be, but at the moment he's only capable of attracting a magnetic object to his body upon contact and following the same theme of senseless talents, the object stays stuck to his body for at least an hour. The last of the three stooges has more of a well-defined talent. The problem is, he's batshit crazy. Rentaro is capable of astral projection, meaning he can separate his soul from his body to simulate an out-of-body experience. His soul can not only face through physical objects, but it can also interact with them. While it remains invisible to the naked eye, the objects he interacts with are as conspicuous as ever, and I imagine it feels like a poltergeist effect to the unsuspecting eye. It's odd that the author chose to portray his projected soul also fully dressed, but that may have been a visual representation to keep the manga and the anime PG enough for airing purposes. If that's not the case, then maybe his talent was only developed enough to allow him to project his soul along with objects he was intimately familiar with, like the clothes he wore every single day, and that would explain why he couldn't materialize a knife through astral projection. Personally though, I feel like the former makes more sense and the author simply didn't want to depict any perception of nudity. The only drawback of this power, and it's a potentially fatal one, is that his physical body remains unguarded, unresponsive and defenseless during the use of his talent. Any sensations experienced by the body are transmitted directly to the soul, and that's exactly how Kyoya manages to subdue him. But with a proper unknown hiding spot for his body, this talent is as invincible as they come. With a bit of luck, you might be able to defeat what you can't see, but you definitely can't beat what you can't touch. He didn't seem too concerned about the distance from his physical body as he was chasing Michiru through the woods, so this is only speculation. But like Kaori, perhaps the length of the island was well within the limits of his talent. And next on the list is a character whose voice actor earned the easiest paycheck in his life. Ryuji had a semi-interesting talent, which is more than I can say for the likes of Shoichi and Sota. He could make his body infinitely small, and we actually see him hide in Fuku's pocket in one of the flashbacks. Apparently, he could shrink to a size so small that he could freely enter and exit pause, and the potential uses of this ability range from espionage to sabotage to just downright assassination. To all intents and purposes, he did appear to be a pretty stand-up guy, and for that alone, he definitely deserved a bit more screen time. I can always see through to the underlying malice in a slit-eyed anime character, but Fuko is honestly as benign as they come. Even when she falls under suspicion and the characters attempt to paint her in a pretentious light, her actions simply come off as clumsy and unnaturally straightforward. She doesn't reach Michiru levels of altruism, but her heart is always in the right place. And for a series with so many psychologically disturbed teenagers, she is a breath of fresh air. Her talent allows her to manipulate the atmosphere in a variety of ways. It's not as versatile as the airbending we see in the Avatar, but given some time, it possibly could develop to such levels. She can generate air currents for simple tasks such as lifting heavy objects and moving them to different locations 
locations. But even though she shows an aversion to displaying it, her power can also be used very aggressively. When Kyoya gets her to demonstrate her power, she conjures torrents of air and compresses them until finally shooting them at her target in a slash-like motion. The damage inflicted from such an attack is fatal, and Kyoya only manages to survive because of his talent. I think he even refers to the pressure from the attack as similar to an industrial water jet, and those things cut through just about anything. However, control over this talent is largely dependent on the atmospheric conditions that are present. In open, well-ventilated spaces, Fuko's accuracy is impeccable, and she can hit the bullseye from a fair distance away. In contrast, she experiences difficulty using her talent in rooms full of stagnant air. Stuffy conditions stifle her control and increase the risk of collateral damage, which is why she refrains from using it in Ryuji's room. But even in open spaces, her control could be better, because once she fires off a projectile, by her own admission, even she can't stop it. If there's anything Fuko is guilty of, it's that she rarely brandishes a smile. And from a personal standpoint, that is simply unacceptable. Though I have to admit, it is part of her charm. And we finally get to the mysterious transfer student that simply wants friends. Kyoya plays antagonist to Nana's anti-hero role for majority of the anime, and for the most part he does a tolerable job at it. I wouldn't exactly describe their battle of wits in the same breath as the one between Light and L, but it does at the very least progress the narrative. As important a character as Kyoya is, there's not much to say about his talent. As far as the events in the anime and manga have demonstrated, he's immortal, and that's about it. Jumping off a cliff, a point blank explosion, drinking poison, a fatal slash to his chest. Kyoya has survived basically everything under the sun. He has a medical condition that disrupts his sense of smell, but apparently that has nothing to do with the restrictions to his talent. He does however state that his immortality comes at a price, and he only reveals this critical bit of information to the first friend he made, and I'm not talking about Nana. If there's a more obvious downside to his power, it's that he's still able to feel exhaustion and pain, and it's fairly easy to deal with the mortal characters because you merely have to dispose of their body in a way that restricts their movement. It's as simple as enshrining his body in concrete and dropping it to the bottom of the sea, and I sincerely hope my therapist isn't listening to this. Next we're going to look at the man known as Tachibana Jin, and a simple disclaimer, this is going to include some major spoilers from the manga, so consider yourself warned. The only person on the island who knows Nana's true intentions is known to us as Tachibana Jin, but we later find out that the real Tachibana is in a coma and this unidentified person is simply assuming his identity. We are not privy to his or her real name and appearance, but there are a number of things that we do know about them, and I'll be referring to them as X. One. X appears to be taking care of the real Tachibana while he's in a sort of coma, and this could imply that they have a cordial relationship. It's either that, or X is the one who placed him in a medically induced coma in order to assume his identity. 2. X is a former student on the island from 5 years prior to the current events. During X's time as a student, the talented waged a war amongst themselves and ended up killing each other. X is one of the only two survivors that we know of, the other being Tachibana. And finally, 3. The details regarding X's talent are increasingly getting less vague the more the story progresses. X is able to shapeshift into exclusively talented individuals and various animals including birds, insects and cats. When copying humans, this talent is restricted to only those with powers, but once transformed, X can copy and utilize their respective abilities. The downside of copying an ability perfectly is that it also comes with the same conditions and restrictions as the original user. I think I said this in the previous video, but aside from now, X possesses the most broken power in the entire series. Coupled with X's quick wit, there's no denying the supremacy of this talent, and you can understand how they would have survived such a bloody battle. It's unclear what conditions X has to meet in order to be able to transform, but what we do know is that they can't transform into people who've already died. The only other limitation to this ability that we know of is that it can't be used when others are watching, and X cleverly uses feints and misdirections to get people to look away before using the ability. And that concludes the analysis of talents from characters that show up in the anime. As at the time of recording, the manga introduces four or five other talented characters, and to be fair, as a collective, their powers are given a bit more substance and reasoning than some of the ridiculous talents that I've explored. I may or may not analyze these talents at a future date, I don't know, depends on how I'm feeling. But let's put it this way, if someone puts in a request for such a video, then I guess I'll do it. Otherwise, I hope you guys enjoyed. Talentless Nana isn't really one of those anime that's gonna be remembered for years to come. You can think of it as the anime version of a summer fling, or a fling of whatever season you watched it in. It was fair while it lasted. Anyway guys, don't forget to leave a like and comment if you have something to add. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification. And until next time, stay safe. Peace.